Graham Garrity, I'm delighted to be joined by a Mead legend, um, me being a Mead woman as well. It's brilliant to have you on. And it came about because I had seen Paddy Curtis, who was the manager of uh, the college team out in New York. He had actually put up a video on Instagram and it was of you shoveling snow in Gaelic Park. And yeah, yeah. I, I texted him and I said, is that Graham Garrity? And he said, he said, yeah, geez, he's over and he's coaching the lads here. And I said, geez, how did that come about? But it was just so great to see it doing so well. And how did it all come about? Um, I was actually over visiting Paddy at Thanksgiving. And um, he'd taken over the college team because he'd won the championship um, the previous year. So he got to be the manager. I think that's how to select it. And um, he was starting training that week and asked, would I come and take a session with him? So I did, and I enjoyed this day, enjoyed it. And he asked me back then in January to do a kind of intense kind of 10 days training with him. I think the reason behind that was because most lads are away at college in, in different areas of, of the state. And they were all off at that stage. So they're all back in, in New York. And it was only probably time that we'd get everybody training collectively. So it was... So the timing was good for me and for him. And, yeah. and these are all American born lads, like 18 to 24 years of age. What's the skill yeah. level like? Um, I was actually very surprised. And uh, I played in New York years ago, back in I suppose, the early 90s. And, and uh, I suppose the skill level at that time, and uh, most of them were, were Irish. It wasn't yeah. great, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's come on leaps and bounds since then. And most of these guys are playing since they were probably five or six anyway, you know, mm -hmm. having probably... Most of them are, you know, their parents are Irish anyway, so they grew up uh, playing Gaelic football and, you know, with the Gaelic ball. So I was very surprised at the skill level they have and, um, you know, the commitment as well. So, you know, it's like we're looking forward, they're coming over here in two weeks, so really looking forward to meeting up with them again and, and starting, uh, I suppose, like we'll have a, a challenge match on, on the Wednesday that are here and then they play Friday and Saturday, so. You know, I'll be looking forward to see how they get on against the Irish teams here. Yeah, definitely. And would any of these lads be on the New York team? Um, I'd say there's probably going to be maybe four or five of them maybe on the panel. So I don't know. They're only kind of in pre-season at the minute. There'll definitely be some of them on the junior team anyway. I think mm -hmm. they come over here as well to play in, in the junior championship. But um, the probably one or two of them would definitely be good enough to be on the senior team anyway. Jeez. And you obviously managed uh, Blanche IT. So when you yeah. train them, say, and then you train the New York lads, is there much difference in the skill? Um, I suppose, like, when I was training at Blanche, then we probably had a couple of county players. So that's mm. the, the only difference. Um, now, there was a lot of kind of lads that were, you know, mediocre club footballers as well that were on the panel. But like, like you have... I suppose that's the mixture you have in every team. Um, yeah. But I think that the one thing with the New York lads is you now they'd know each other from playing against each other, you know, week in, week out. The college's lads here might have seen one lad, you know, from one end of the, the year to the other or, or when they're in college. So it, it's, it's, that's the, I suppose, advantage that they, that they have that way. But mm -hmm. the big disadvantage to have is that they don't have challenge games. They, they can't play against anybody, really, only the New York juniors or, or some of the senior team as well. So that's the disadvantage to have coming over, that they don't have those, um, you know, the luxury of having, you know, pre-season games or, or, or even, you know, they enter at the, at the semi-final stage here. So mm -hmm. the guys that they'll be playing against would have had, you know, come through the league base of, of the championship. So that's the disadvantage that they have. Yeah, they don't get as much game time. And what did you no. make of, of Gaelic Park? You said you were out there in, I think it was 93, 94. I was actually out yeah. there in 2013. I remember people telling me that you would come out years ago. And I think it was me juniors yeah. you played on. The me juniors, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the standard then. <laughs> But we were after winning the under-21 championship here. So there was four or five of us of the, that under-21 team that played in um, New York. Uh, there was a local fellow here beside me, Jerry Hebe from Belieber. He was the manager of the team. And um, they brought us out for, I think we were there probably for six or seven weeks. And we ended up winning the championship. But it was, I know it was only a junior championship. It was great to, I suppose, for them that hadn't won it before. And uh, I suppose for us going out as well, it was, you know, it was great to, I suppose, make it worth your while traveling as you did come home with something. 
Oh, absolutely. And when I went out, I went out for three months and I didn't come back for three years. That didn't happen to you? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, it nearly did. Um, I think the rest of the lads were getting ready to go and I said, oh, I don't think I'm going to go home. I'm going to stay here. And I got cold feet at the last minute, so I ended up coming back. And just um, talking about as well the Blanchetown IT. So you actually, if I'm right in saying, actually went back and played for them. Yeah, so I think that came about, I was training the college um, and I trained them to that Division 3 championship and then the following year then we won the uh, Trench Cup and uh, I was I actually went back to college then so I ended up playing then in the, in the Seagerson. I always wanted to play Seagerson Cup anyway and because I was the manager I was able to pick myself anyway. So it was, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the one advantage of us. Oh God, but, make the uh, team around you. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I great help there with Val Andrews as well. So he was, he was lecturer in the college too, and and he, I suppose, typical Val. He comes in when we're doing well and, and tries to take over. But uh, he was a great <laughs> help as well. Yeah. And so you would have probably been in your what late thirties at that time. I was um, when I was playing Sagers, and I was forty. So oh right, uh, yeah. Wow. And they actually played the following year as well. So I would have been 41 playing. Probably one of the oldest. That's some going, fair play. Yeah. And ah, listen, it was, I suppose, the fact that we hadn't huge numbers either, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, um, it was easier. If any of the bigger colleges, you probably wouldn't have even got on the subs bench, but uh, take advantage of every, every opportunity. Anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And you actually went on to do a course and then went into being a social worker actually after that. Yeah, I'm a social care worker with three steps. So um, I've been off actually for the last year or so. So I'm coming back now in a couple of weeks. So looking forward to that now. It's, it's, it's been a long, I suppose, a long haul getting getting back. But uh, we have to go back sometime. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And they obviously gave you some time off. Um, as well yeah. and mm. what sort of work did you do you do with them or, or what's it like well I suppose like the houses I work in they're, they're residential houses so the kids stay there full time um, they be they just they're there for different reasons maybe mm -hmm. for broken homes or, or you know for for several different reasons so we just kind of look after them and trying to educate them in the way of life really and, and prepare them for from moving on to stay with us till they're 18. Um, there are some exceptions where they stay longer, but uh, just, you know, get them ready for life and get them ready for work and, and really to just and get them back into society. Brilliant. And obviously we all heard about your illness that you had um, and you're saying there that you took some time off. It was quite a serious illness. Um, I remember when the news broke, It, I think it shook not just the GA community, but it took literally a, a lot of people across yeah. Ireland. Um, how are you doing now? Uh, I'm doing good now, thank God. Um, as I said, it was a long road, but mostly like tiredness now is is, is still a big thing, but just, you know, that could take a couple of years to get over that. Maybe I'm just getting older as well, but um, mm -hmm. it's, you know, like three sets have given me all the time I need to I suppose, get back, right? And, as, you know, so as I'm ready to, to move on and, and, and put all that behind me. But, uh, you know, so the family has been very good to me um, and friends. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's time to move on and, and try and put it all behind me at this stage. Oh, absolutely. And um, as you said, it must have been a very difficult time for your family and friends mm. as well. And just mentally for to understand why it happened or how it happened, because I think I remember listening to the first podcast you had did was, I think it was with Ushi McConville. Um, yeah. It was the first time I had heard uh, since it all happened how you were doing and you had said that it just sort of came out of nowhere so mentally is it hard to sort of understand all of that? Yeah I suppose like I was at work and I was a colleague was with me Ian Daly and um, he I was just chatting to him it was about 10 o'clock at night and I just got a pain the front of my head I just thought it was getting a headache and it just kind of went straight through my head into the back of my neck and it was horrific like he knew straight away there was something, something not right, and mm. he rang an ambulance straight away. Got me downstairs and put me on the couch, and, and you know, I suppose it was his quick thinking, and, and I suppose the ambulance service from Navin Hospital there. To, I think they were there in about twenty minutes, you know. So 
I got in straight away and they di- diagnosed what was wrong straight away. And so I was able to kind of get the, I suppose, the, the help I needed quickly. And that was the, the key, I think, really, you know. So um, mm-hmm. I had the operation then the following day. It was, I think it was an eight hour operation. So it was it, it was huge, like, you know. But thankfully, I came out the other side of it, um, you know, with no no real side effects as such. So, um, you know, delighted with the care I got in Bowman. And I suppose, like, the care, like, afterwards as well, even, the, you know, the amount of goodwill and, and good wishes that I got from, I suppose, all over the world as well, which surprised mm. me kind of in a way too, you know. So, yeah. all the expats, I think, in Australia and Canada and America, you know, England. It's amazing. And I, I think sometimes it shows just what the the GA community uh, can do for you and can be there for you, especially when you go through these times. There really was a big outpouring. Um, I yeah, had spoke yeah. to Trevor Giles around that time. We, we had an interview scheduled and he said he had, you know, text you and just wished you well and all yeah. of that. Um, one of the messages I actually seen was from Kieran Donahue as well. He just put up on Twitter that you were his first roommate in the international rules and you looked out from at yeah. that time and, you know, we just wished you well. Um, so no, it, it, it's great to, to see you doing so well again. Ah, it is, and, and it's nice to get those messages as well. I suppose from lads you played against, people you don't even know. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, it, it does help. And, you know, I suppose the first couple of months were difficult, but... Um, as I said, we get over all these things and, you know, there's worse people after me out there. So there's no point in, I suppose, you know, thinking about it too much. Oh, well, it's great to, to hear you doing so well. And just speaking about the international rules, did you enjoy playing it, the physicality of it? Uh, I did, yeah. I think I, that was probably the thing that appealed to me kind of more so than the game itself because it, it can be scrappy. You know, the physicality, we don't probably get as as much now in the GA and I think that was a spectacle for everybody really to, to uh, you know there always knew there was going to be contact or a row or something I think that's appealed to a lot of the Irish people as well but like it did get overboard I think it was in um, 96 kind of it got a bit you know I think it was in Crow Park Sean yeah. Boylan could have been the manager at the time it did get very aggressive and I think the tackle after after the ball or the antics of you know after the ball was gone was a bit too much but uh, you know it's good to see it back again but it's pro- for me it's not the same as it was to take the physicality out of a bit and I think as I said that's a bit appeal to a lot of the spectators going to the games You had a serious injury I remember it was like uh, your your neck wasn't it it came, it came down right Yeah on top so um, that's what I said like the, the tackle itself was fine but the fact that I had my arms trapped, I couldn't protect myself when I was mm-hmm. falling. I banged my head off the ground and I was knocked unconscious. So um, I probably should have spent the night in, 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 in the matter hospital, but uh, I decided to, to, to leave, which I shouldn't have done, <laughs> you know. But, Where did you go? Um, did, you, did you just want to go out or what was going on? No, I just I went back to the reception. I ended up going back to the hotel. Oh, I, think, like, I went to bed then early because I wasn't feeling well. No. You know, so obviously mm-hmm. had a bit of concussion still. So well, not wise. Not no. wise, no, not at all. Um, and obviously it was it was brilliant to play for your country. And then, as you said, playing against lads and playing with lads that you probably you know had rivalries against. How did you oh, get yeah. on with all them? Yeah. I would get on. Like I suppose the fact that we were training here for maybe five or six weeks beforehand, and then mm-hmm. when you go out, then you're obviously you know you're training every day. Was uh, as I said, I stayed with Kieran Donny here, and then I went then to went to Australia, and uh, they were calling it the room names. And I was, was Graham Garrett, and I says, I says, please don't put me with Kieran McGeaney or something. So, Kieran McGeaney, I said, oh Jesus, no, because we over the years we would have kind of knocked lumps out of each other. I said, yeah, I, I had visions of waking up during the night and he kicking the crap out of me or something. <laughs> but uh, no, pure gentleman, like so. But, He's obviously, you know, he doesn't on the pitch. He's a fiery character. Was off. I think he's one of the nicest guys you'd meet. You know, of course. Um, yeah, we great times like that. He probably thought the same about you. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose over the years, um, our, all our pre-season cha- or pre-championship games, we would have played our in probably a month before 
the championship started and it was just the referee would throw the ball in and I think they used to get Pat McEnany to referee most of the games because he just throw the Let ball in on. and that was it then. We'd knock lumps out of each other but uh, once it was over then, you know, that was it. Like, kind of to prepare us for what was to come was, um, yeah, no, like to, to play with some of the best players in the country was fabulous. Like, and I suppose the trips away are always special as well because we're all together every day, you know, you eat and drink together and I was going to say sleep together, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God you didn't. <laughs> but I'm sure that you, you kept good friendships with them over the years then. Oh, yeah, you'd always be in, well, you wouldn't be in contact with them that much, but if you meet them out and that's, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, you'd always have something to talk about, all right. Brilliant. And another interesting thing about you is that you actually had trials with Arsenal. I always remember this story growing up. Yeah. And then you think... Geez, what could have been like if you maybe concentrated on soccer? Do you think that could have been the path you would have went down? Yeah, um, I don't know. I I hadn't played a huge amount of it here. I was I was I always played the Kansas and Rovers and and um, you know we were in the Beaton District League. But uh, you know to get that call was was out of the blue. Totally, really it came through Alex Ferguson. I think being at the Mead Dublin game and, and he commented on I think myself and Tommy Dowd and one or two of the Dublin players but I got a phone call uh, from I suppose Arsenal to go for, for trials so I thought I'd done well over there but I think the time they were looking for someone to replace Lee Dixon and I just wasn't ready for that but I think if it was left probably you know you, you'd need probably six months a year to get your kind of bearings and, and, and you know to get in on, on the whole professional kind of soccer end of it but uh it wasn't for me to come back here and, and, and you know, I suppose Gaelic was my first love and that's what really what I wanted to do. Yeah, and me as a mead person, thank God you did. Yeah, I'm delighted you, you chose the path you did. Yeah, we, well, we had a few good years after that. So <laughs> right, uh, yeah. Well, I might bring you down uh, memory road if you don't mind. Um, the 1999, you, you captained mead to the All-Ireland that year. I remember yeah. you lifting the cup. It was in the, the middle of Crow Park, actually yeah. on the pitch, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I suppose that was, um, it was a good thing and it was a bad thing for me as well. I suppose any player wants to, I suppose, play for the county and then the captain and winning the Ireland was fantastic. And they all, everyone wants to climb the steps mm-hmm. of the Hogan stand. But I think for safety and crowd reasons that that, that, that tried that that year, I think. But um, the positive thing about it was when, I went round kind of the, the perimeter of the pitch afterwards. You see all your friends and I suppose lads you played with and selectors and mentors over the years. So with, and my own club mates and, and I suppose lads that trained me over the years. So that was the good thing about it. And I get I got to meet my parents as well, which you know, it was on a crowded pitch, you wouldn't see anybody probably for you know a day or two until, until the whole thing died down. So that was the plus side of it. But listen, to lift it anywhere was an honour for me and it was something special that you never forget yeah no i i remember it like i actually i got your autograph that day a <laughs> funny thing <laughs> <laughs> i actually was i was waiting in uh we were in the county club and in chocolate so oh, yeah yeah you yeah. all arrived back and i think i was six or seven at the time and i remember saying to my mom i was like i'm gonna get his autograph and my mom was sort of pulling me back and i remember you were up uh you were with on boiling up the very top of the marquee and I just squeezed through a few people and, and got your autograph that day. So, it, yeah, yeah it I think, was it. you know, I suppose that was the good thing, I suppose, then about, you know, it, it's it's all kind of nearly enclosed now. You don't get to to, to see the players mm. now. That time, you know, the county club was kind of the attraction for everybody. The team went back there. We mixed with, with, with the supporters and, and you know, it was, there were great occasions and great for us as well, I suppose, to, to, to meet I suppose the fans as well and mm-hmm. you know so it was all kind of a little kind of a, a big family thing then you know compared to now you nearly can't yeah. get near any player now that's what I'm uh, that's what I was going to ask do you think it's changed a lot I think it has yeah I suppose social media probably has a lot to, I suppose to play too you know players we I suppose that time we were just talking about it yesterday it's like after most games we used to all go for a drink and you nearly mm-hmm. can't do that now just everybody has a camera phone and no matter what you do, then it's up on social media. And yeah. I think it's, you know, the players need to enjoy the game now as well as, you know, enjoy what happens after games rather than, you know, if you lose a game now, you're nearly going to train and nearly straight away, you know. So it's, it's 
I think it's, it's pushing probably a lot of players away from playing inter county football as well because the commitment is massive. Massive. And anytime I talk to anyone who has stepped away, a lot of people say just it, it takes over your whole life. So you nearly have to make a decision whether you want this type of career or you want to play for your county or family mm. or different things. I know there's people that can can balance it all, but it's it's a really big toll on a lot of lads and girls. Yeah, it is tough. And I suppose but the younger guys coming in as well, you know, they're at college, they're playing college mm. football, club football, county football, and then trying to balance that with friends as well. And then if, if you have any relationship at all, you know, wherever you're with, you know, they have to row in behind as well because it's, it's more difficult for them because you're not allowed to go out or... Yeah. Uh, well, that's the way it's gone now. Players don't go out anywhere and look after their body probably a little bit better than what we used to maybe, you know. <laughs> but um, it's, as I said, they need to, I think, enjoy enjoy life and enjoy playing sport and and what goes with it and just bringing it back to you again and and your good memories what sort of captain were you like were you a talker in the dressing room uh i suppose every captain is but like when i was captain we had huge leaders everywhere like Mm -hmm. trevor giles john mcdermott darren fay you know tommy dowd so you didn't you didn't really have to say a whole lot obviously you know when we're having meetings and you'd, you'd say a few words but then like we had the best talker in the world and Sean Boylan really as well mm-hmm. so you know he took probably a lot of pressure off anybody that was captain you know because I suppose every every game before you go out you just have the last few words and, and that was it but I think once the game was on everybody kind of stepped up to the place and, and took on that mantle of you know doing something extra for the team and that was kind of special about those from, I suppose, 96. Well, if you go back to 87, 88, mm-hmm. and if they were the same as well, like the, the huge leaders all over the pitch, and that continued up to probably maybe 2001, and things have kind of been on the slide since then. Yeah, unfortunately, um, Sean Boylan, what a man. Obviously, everything that he's done for, for me football. What was your relationship like with him? Um, we actually had a very good relationship. I think he, Sean kind of had a good relationship with most of the players anyway. Um, he was always kind of somebody that you were able to turn to and, and, and talk to really, you know, mm-hmm. and about anything. And, uh, you know, he's a wise man and, and, you know, you'd listen to what he's going to say really, you know, and he'd steer you, you know, the best of his ability. And, you know, it was a... I was lucky, I suppose, that I grew up in that era where I was able to play under him. And, and you know, me, GA, and G in general have an awful lot to thank him for. Big time. And he's still going. He's still, yeah, uh, he was in yeah. with the, the under 20s there and down. Um, Connor Laverty and Marty Clare yeah. and Brendy McVeigh, they were all in there together. That was unbelievable to see um, him still at this age yeah, still there. Yeah, because I think he was, with, he, he was with UCD with them as well, I think, and that's how that kind of came about. But it, it keeps him young, you know, he's yeah. a great man and, 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 you know, he loves the sport and I think anything that he can do to help anybody, he will. Mm-hmm. That's definitely the, the vibe you get from Sean. And he had some mad training techniques. Betty Town, Hill of Tara, I think you did some water polo and you, you did some, some yeah. mad things. <laughs> we, we played football with tennis balls and rugby balls and everything. Like it was, so we were, so this fella's mad half the time, you know, but it was, <laughs> I suppose it was all, you know, when you're looking back then, it was all kind of like hand eye coordination and, mm. you know, judging the bounce of the ball and, you know, different things. We played rugby as well a couple of times and I think it's all for support play. We played basketball, you know, so, you know, he he, he had uh, all these kind of different, I think he was way ahead of his time. Really, yeah. You know, um, but, uh, you know, it, it left it interesting, you know, we often trained in Garmerston with, uh, in the pool with buoyancy jackets on us. Some of the lads couldn't swim and, you know, you were in like, it was a deep pool there, so it was about 12 foot. But if you stop running, you were sinking to the bottom. So <laughs> could it was you swim? For lads to keep moving. <laughs> and could you swim? Uh, not great, but I was able to kind of <laughs> keep myself up. Anyway. And he often took his away on trips and that as well. I I, I heard it, you went foreign a few times and you, you stayed in Ireland a few times as well. Yeah, we went. Um, 
I remember one time we went to Hollyhead training. It was in 99. And he came to me after one, uh, I think it was a Tuesday, and he said, I want to do something the weekend. And I said, yeah, yeah. So I want to, you know, bring the lads away. I said, maybe go down to Kerry or something or whatever. He said, I said, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, but we're going to go to Hollyhead. I said, fuck, jeez, Hollyhead, what is going on? <laughs> so I think we met at half four in the morning, got the early boat over, and then by, I think, 12 o'clock, we had two training sessions done and done a video session oh then in the afternoon. Gosh. If you said and Trevor Giles fell asleep on top of each other and um, <laughs> looked at the video. So he said, looking back, said, he was on about years after he was gas. Says, look over, he says, there was yourself and Trevor, and he was lying on top of each other asleep. And we do <laughs> video analysis, but I suppose, you know, it, it's, it's, there are the things that kind of mm. matter. Right? And, and, and I suppose when you look back, you know, it's great to see them. We went, um, I think it was in 97, I think we went to uh, Lanzarote or the Canaries training as well. And we were down along the beach and there was, I suppose there was kind of that small cliff of the road on top looking over where we were training. Mm-hmm. And I think Martin O'Connell was after getting um, sunburn the day before. And Martin would be very fair, I suppose, saying to himself. And he was red raw front and back and oh, Sean God. kind of had us uh, so we're down to our skin like and you're he says, put your hands down by your side if you, if you can't see the video and then he was like this slapping kind of front and back and Martin and Colin was like this he was, oh, no. like he was red raw and there was there was people up I'd say they were looking down and says Jesus these guys must be out of some kind of asylum or something he's slapping them, <laughs> slapping the hell out of each other and and, and but, oh uh, my god. Poor old Martin was born to a crisp, so he didn't enjoy that anyway. And see, so many uh, people would talk about the me team at that time and how tough they were. Sure, no wonder you were, <laughs> you were told yeah, this is yeah. the type of training you were doing. <laughs> well, I suppose the best, the best training, the best games we got were kind of in-house because mm-hmm. everybody wants to be on the team. Uh, and, you know, there was, there was, I suppose, 30 odd lads there, so they could only pick 15 and 24 on the, on the I suppose, the, the panel for the game. So Evan was very competitive. And any guy we brought in then as well was looking to impress too. So, you know, so it was, there were good times. Oh, absolutely. And you used to go to Betty's Town as well. Um, when the Sean Boylan documentary came out, we, we got to see yeah. uh, some footage of that. Yeah, no, running in, up and down the dunes. I think, I suppose, initially the start was in Gormish Town. So there was a hill probably that went nearly vertical so it was lads went up and down that and, and in and out around the dunes as well um i remember being out one time it was kind of it was i suppose late or early summer maybe out in, in um gormerson beach and it was spilling rain and he said right lads in this gas and i was saying is he serious like you know so well, we're going to get wet anyway so yeah was, yeah it was um yeah, out in the spilling rain, out in the freezing cold water in, in, in uh, Gormanstown. But then we ended up going to the dunes in Bettystown as well. And so this, it, was, it was different as well. I think a lot of clubs then kind of adopted kind of the same kind of training regime. And, and up at the Hill of Tara, then was another, another favourite haunt for him as well. So yeah, it was and brutal he- for us, but it was, it was great training. Yeah, it looks like he really was ahead of the time because even those trips away to, to Lanzarote and that, like it, you don't even really hear of that anymore unless they're going on, no. a, on, on a team holiday after winning the All-Ireland. Yeah. You don't hear yeah. that. Yeah. No, and I think there was one time then that he kind of mulled about the idea of going cross-country skiing as well. <laughs> but um, that didn't materialise any of us. It would have... Like it just shows you the way he was thinking, like you know, yeah. for for stamina and uh, you know strength and condition, probably training. That that's really what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it might have been out of the county board's budget. Yeah, <laughs> I'm surprised he's even got as far as Lanzarote. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose those times it was different. You, know, you had, I suppose, Keypack would have been involved yeah. in the days, and I would have been a lot of money into the I suppose me G at the time but uh, you know it was there were different times then and I suppose there's so much going on now there's not enough there's not people willing to splash out the same 
Mm -hmm. Same amount, you know. And I'll bring it back to, to 96. Um, I actually wrote an article for the Meat Chronicle back last year, I think it was, and I was saying yeah. that this was my earliest memory. Like I, I was now a four, right? And I, I was like, how would you remember when you're four? But see, my granddad and gra um, granny were from Mayo. So we were always yeah. very much uh, uh, divided um, in the house. And I'd always have the Meat jersey, a Mayo hat. And that was just the way it was. But they were some mm. games when you look back in that 1996, like so intense in the replay. Yeah. Looking back on it now, um, even when you watch it, it, does it does it take you back? Uh, it does. I suppose I was watching something there at the end of last year, and reeling in the years was on, and it was on it. You know, it was. <laughs> I suppose that time, I suppose the the row was a huge thing, and probably mm -hmm. still is, and would be. I suppose depending on what part of Mayo you go to, would be, you know, very contentious um, topic. But uh, yeah, I suppose. Playing those games, things happen so fast, and and mm -hmm. you know, it was the first game we looked like we were dead and buried, and and probably should have been really, you know. And was it it's just typical of what happened to Mayo since then, where they should have got across yeah. in a couple of Ireland's and didn't. But uh, you know, we were steep enough the first day. Colin Kyle kicked a long speculative ball in, and and it ended up bouncing over the bar. So, and. Um, we were lucky enough to get another shot at it, but I suppose the big thing the next day was I suppose Liam McHale getting like he got man the match in, in the in the first game and him getting sent off in the first five or six minutes of the replay was I suppose a huge benefit for us because mm -hmm. we also lost Colin Kyle, but you know, they'd argue, you know, the, they lost our midfielder, which is probably more of a you know, influential, you know, position. But uh yeah, no, it probably opened up the play a little bit. And, and like that again, the second day, Mayo went six points up twice and, and probably should have finished it off, but but didn't, you know. So I think Brendan Riley crept up and kicked the scorer's left foot to, to clinch it for us. But, uh, you know, they were fantastic games. And, and you know, looking back on them, they're probably iconic, probably still in mm -hmm. 100 years' time. You know, we won't be around to look at it. Maybe you might be, but yeah. it's... It, it, it's um, you know, they were great games. And just when you mentioned Lee McHale there, like he talked about it recently that he says it still hurts. It really hurts him to this day. And I'm, I'm sure it always will. Um, yeah. you, have you ever chatted to him since then or any of the Mayo lads? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I remember being up in Crow Park. I think it was, it was one of the GPA dudes, I think. And McHale was at it and Colin Coyle was at it. But Colin... No, we didn't go to these things, and they hadn't spoken since then. And uh, we kind of so we knew there was, you know, a bit of tension there between mm -hmm. them. And we knew McKay was really, you know, hurt over the whole. But we, we end up getting together on him and, and had a bit of a banter about it. But you could still see he was, you know, put out about it a small bit. But this broke the ice a small bit in between us, so both teams. But you, I, you would see them over the years, you know, and and. and I suppose looking back, it's 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 easy for us to look back because we won it, but uh, it still has to be difficult for them, you know. But if oh, you look yeah. at like James James Horn for them was probably the best player they had that year. And he, he scored five points, I think, in, in both finals. Jeez. And you know, he's gone on to mm. you know do good things with them since and I suppose, you know, lifting the or Sam Maguire as manager would be you know, would cap off a fantastic career for him, but it's eluded him so far, but you never know. You never know. It has to be coming. It has to be. That's what, that's what I say. And yeah. it might seem like a bit of a strange question to ask you, but what's life like now for Graham Garrity? Like, do people stop you and notice you and all of that when you're you're out and about? Uh, not as much anymore, no. No, thank <laughs> God. But, um, <laughs> I suppose, you know, we don't generally... You know, I suppose head too far, you know, but that's what it, like if you're away or it could be in England or even you're America, people would kind of notice him and, and, and want to talk to or want to talk GA. But uh, it's, it's all good as well, and it's it, it's nice to reminisce and look back on, on the good days, but um, you know, don't get as much too, too much anymore. People say, Graham, who? <laughs> <laughs> Oh geez, not to me anyway, and not to a lot of a lot of me people. 
And what about your, your kids? Do they realise what you've done? <laughs> um, uh, I suppose that Sophia, she was one when we won in, in, in 99. She was sitting in the cup. Um, ah, they do. So looking back now, they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the little lad, Bo, oh, he's only six now. I remember he, he was over in my parents' house the other day and he says, you know, my dad's famous, he said. <laughs> he wasn't even... So I, I, he was obviously listening to something that we were, that's where we were, someone was talking about football or whatever, and someone said something to him, but he was back telling me parents, yeah. Oh, God. Famous. And but, would you show the videos? Uh, no, he has, no. He's too much. He, he might look it up himself on YouTube one time. One, one day. day. He's, he, he's, he's a bit young for a death anyway. Yeah. Leave him. Even be <laughs> don't put any pressure on them. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And just a few questions before we finish up. So, if I had to ask you your your best player you've ever played with, who would you say? Um, I suppose I'd have to look at my own county. Really, you know, for me, like I would have played with a lot of good players, and they were all associated in my own, like with John McDermott, um, you know, Darren Fay. But mm -hmm. for me, Trevor Giles would would have to be um, the best player I played with. I suppose two things that, you know, he's a fantastic reader of the game, but for where I was playing, he was the best lad to have out around mm -hmm. the field because he could put it on the sixpence for you, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it was great to have a player of his ability out there that was able to do that. And, uh, you know, if, I suppose this, if you're going outside kind of mead, um, Going back probably in my earlier days, uh, Seamus Moynihan for, for, for Kerry would have been probably one of my favourite players. I would have played against a minor number 21 and, and a senior level. So those those two of so us would be at the top of the list for me. Brilliant. And Trevor Giles, he played best when he put the sleeves off his jersey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he got his hand slapped a few times by that because I think the county board got fined every time he... He cut the sleeve. So I remember going out to the Ireland final. Sean got on. He said, don't cut the, the um, sleeves <laughs> off. No, 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 I won't, Sean. So we were ready to go out and no sign of Trevor. He's in the toilet. He came out with the jersey in his hand. He hadn't got it on him. And uh, just as we were going out the door, he put it over his head and the sleeves went off it again. And I think, so what do you do? You can't give out to a player with his ability. <laughs> no, and if you meet him or talk to him like he... He doesn't seem the type of lad to be breaking rules or anything like he just no and he and he wouldn't have been a lad to kind of show both either really you yeah know? a lot of us around with kind of queer hairdos and white boots and he was never into any of that stuff no. so, like so we were all surprised when when he done it himself like you know i don't know what the reason behind it was whether i think he'd say stop lads pulling his chairs you have to keep him keep him cool one of one the two but you know, it's so funny. It, it was totally out of character for him, really, anyway, you know, which made it kind of funny as well. Oh, it was brilliant. And it's iconic now at, at this stage. Um, yeah. And for, for you then, your best play in memory, if you look back, what one would you pick? Um, I suppose for me, obviously, I suppose lifting the Sam Maguire, but I think go back to 96, um, the game against Tyrone, that would it kind of has to stand out for a couple of reasons. That's um, one I played well. I suppose that was the main reason. Um, two, I suppose that's like that year we came out of nowhere. Tyrone were expected to win the Ireland after being beaten the year before, and we just kind of railroaded them really. And uh, you know, I remember warming up or out on the pitch, and we were out first, and Tyrone came out, and the. The noise was deaf, and I was looking at Don and Kurtz, and we just started laughing because it was real, so surreal, like you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, like it was just like we were there to make up the numbers, but uh, you know, we had different ideas, you know. But um, yeah, yeah. So it was just kind of uh, everything went right for for the team that day, and particularly myself. And and, and looking back, and you know, that was one of the the best memories, I suppose. Well, you have a lot to, to pick from, so um, a tough choice, I'm sure. Yeah. And just speaking of Tyrone there, obviously we've seen what they did last year, and um, they sort of came out mm. of nowhere and went on to, to win the All-Ireland. 
and Mead at the moment. Um, how do you do you see Mead football at the minute? It's obviously yeah, not going too I great suppose, after the loss to Galway at the weekend. Yeah, it's worrying, I suppose. To, like I was expecting Galway to win that game anyway, especially mm-hmm. if, like we always find it difficult to play against them down there. But I think the manner and defeat, you know, has to be a little bit worrying for, for Andy McEntee and, and his backroom staff, you know, not to score for 45 minutes is, is I suppose it's it's unacceptable really at that level, mm-hmm. really. It's, it's, it's really unheard of no matter how bad a team is playing, they'll, they'll threaten at some stage. But, uh, you know, it's a long, it's a long road ahead from there. Another loss, they're playing less common on Sunday, so that's going to be another um, difficult game. Very tough, them. yeah. Yeah, so, like, you know, they're look, like, if you look at it, Meads, don't do well in the league and, and and you know, get relegated. Unless they get to a, or win a provincial title or they won't be playing in, in, in the Sam Maguire, they'll end up playing the Talton Cup, which is, mm-hmm. it'll be a total disaster, I suppose. But, uh, you know, so just have to regroup and, and, and try and push on. We've seen Tyrone last year, they were beaten by 25 points down in Kerry and went yeah. on to win the Lerner. But uh, it might happen to me, you never know. And what about you? Would you ever go in as a as a manager? Um, I think it's at this stage probably not. You know, a few years ago it was on my radar, all right, but uh, not now. I don't think. No, the, the time and effort is 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 massive. Mm-hmm. You know, um, whether I want to give that commitment or not, I'm not really sure at the minute. You know, so mm-hmm. I think Amanda might have other things to say about that as well. So. <laughs> Yeah, she'd probably like it to have a bit of time at home after all you've given to, to Mead football over the years. Well, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I suppose that she would often say to her friends, we we hadn't had a summer holiday for nearly 20 years, you know, so it was we were only able to happen when we were finished playing football. So whether it was with club or county, you were always involved in, in, in some way. It's nice to have, I suppose, time away from it now as well. This is it. A lot of people don't realise how much partners give up when their they yeah. other partner is playing, you know, county level. They miss out yeah. on a lot. Oh, no, it's huge, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And I suppose then, you know, it's... Back then, it was different, really. I suppose if if player wasn't out, the partner wouldn't probably go out either. And if you had kids involved as well, you know, it was always, you know, somebody had to be at home with them. But uh, it's 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 tough on wives and girlfriends. And, and, you know, you could see why a lot of players might step away, as I said before. Um, mm-hmm. But... Uh, Commitment is massive now, and, and you know it's it's okay for the likes of Dublin and Kerry's and, and and you know teams that are winning. So Tyrone that's are getting rewards at the end of it. But you have teams, mm-hmm. like you have other, you have thirty two other teams that get nothing. Yeah, you know? this is it. Yeah, and so now for you, you're going to be meeting back up with the the New York team at the end of February. Yeah. They're over, isn't it? They're over now on the sixteenth of February. So in two weeks. Yeah, I think tomorrow, tomorrow two weeks they arrive here. So, uh, you know, it's it's. I'm looking forward to it, and you know, looking forward to see how they get on. You mm-hmm. know, over here, um, obviously, you know, it's it's different. I suppose playing in America than here, as you know yourself, you were over there. It's mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's probably a lot quicker over there at this time of year, even because, you know, the ground is harder. The, the surface, the yeah, weather is better. Yeah, so, um. Be interested to see how they get on with the, the wet ball and, and, and the yeah. soft ground, you know. But ah, listen, they're looking forward to them. That's putting in a huge effort since uh, before Christmas. So uh, they're ready any to take on us, whoever we play against, have to throw against them. Brilliant. Well, we wish you all the best with it. And thanks so much now for taking the time to come on and chat to me today. You're welcome. Thanks a million. And we'll chat again soon. Yeah. Okay. Take care.